Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Friday, June 18th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about the Democratic Party and their chances at victory and retaining their majority in both the House and Senate in 2022. Now, I came across this article back on June 11th, June 12th, around that time period, and I didn't actually read the entire thing, but now, uh, reading it, I think it's something that is worth sharing with you guys, something that I think is worthy of making a video on, and we're actually going to go a little bit more in depth into this model as it takes into consideration the generic ballot and applies it to our 2022 midterm elections. Now, looking through this article, I thought something was quite coincidental. Uh, currently, I am in Atlanta, and I'm actually staying at Emory University for the weekend, and I found out that the political science professor that came out with this forecast teaches here. So I thought that was something that was quite interesting. Um, I'm going to be at Atlanta for just a few days, but uh, I just thought that was something that I wanted to point out because I thought it was quite coincidental. But looking at his forecast, he takes into account nothing more really than the generic ballot. You can find it here on the Center for Politics, uh, part of the Sabato's Crystal Ball website, uh, where it talks about forecasting the election based off of just the sole idea of using the midterm uh, generic congressional data. They do generic congressional data election after election. We can actually see it recently employed in 2018. They did it in 2020, but the presidential uh, polling data probably was a better indicator than the generic ballot one. But looking at the 2018 generic congressional vote, you can see that with the Democratic Party with a seven point victory, they actually ended up winning by eight points in the final vote. But that was what the generic ballot was gauging, how voters were going to vote when it came down to the overall national scale, which meant that Democrats did pretty well back in 2018. So this forecast takes into account a number of things. I've highlighted a few important uh, things that I want to mention just because it is crucial to understanding how this model works and where it gets its uh, predictions from and how it applies the generic ballot to some of these numbers. So looking at the key points, the first thing that it does point out is that the president party, uh, the president's party often loses ground in the midterm elections. And we sort of knew that, you know, midterm elections, 2018, 2014, election year after election year, you will see the incumbent party lose seats in the House. In 2006, under George W. Bush, the Democratic Party won back control during that midterm election. In 2014, Republicans expanded their already large House majority due to Obama being unpopular and a referendum against the incumbent president. In 2018, the Democratic Party did the same exact thing. They were able to win back control of the United States House, the United States House of Representatives, largely due to anti-Trump sentiment across the United States. So looking at this forecast, it addresses the obvious that in the midterm elections, Typically speaking, the incumbent president's party loses votes, loses a number of seats. But it also points out that the model says in order for Democrats to retain control of the Senate, all they need is a single digit lead. And that sort of makes sense. If you're looking at the 2020 Senate election results, there aren't many opportunities for Republicans in 2022. After Democrats won Georgia and put them in a very tricky position, we can actually see the 2022 Senate elections and you'll honestly understand why it isn't super competitive. So as I click on this map, I want you to go through some of these swing states, some of the standard ones. Most of them are on the Republican side. While Democrats do have Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and New Hampshire to worry about, Republicans have Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, potentially Ohio, potentially Iowa, some of these states that are more competitive, traditionally speaking, just more of them on the Republican side. In addition, you're also looking at a Senate map where you have all of the Democratic incumbents running and five Republicans retiring. That's also a warning sign that, wait a second, this isn't going to be some landslide or blowout for the GOP like they might be expecting, which sort of gives us an understanding as to why the generic ballot only needs a single digit lead for Democrats to keep control of the Senate. But the House is certainly a lot more trickier. Looking at the 2020 House election results, that's 2010. I will show you 2020 right now. We'll go into 2010 uh, in just a few minutes, but you will see here that the Democratic Party only won 222 seats out of 435, the Republicans winning 213, the narrowest House majority since 2003. Uh, this is a very close election. I mean, looking at the uh, Democratic Party losing a number of seats, it is quite embarrassing, I would say. Something that was expected to be a gain for the Democrats ultimately ended up being a loss. And I point this out every time I go through the House elections because it cannot be understated 
looking at the toss-up districts, not a single toss-up district went towards the Democratic Party. So what you should be getting from this is that the Democrats are starting out in 2022 with a disadvantage. Not only will Republicans have that midterm history on the, their side, we are in the middle of a redistricting process, which will allow states with Republicans taking control of 100 more seats than Democrats to single-handedly draw congressional districts in their liking, in their favor. Democrats have opted in for independent commissions in many states, taking away a lot of their power from some of the larger states and from some of the states across the United States. Republicans in many states and many swing states, Georgia, Ohio, Florida, Texas, have all kept it under Republican control and have not opted for an independent commission, thus making the state more likely to be Republican gerrymandered. So the Democrats are starting off with the disadvantage of it just being a midterm year in addition to this... Uh, uh, midterm redistricting fiasco, which means that the Democratic Party, if they were to retain their majority, they would not be winning by a lot. They would not be expanding their House majority by a pretty considerable amount. And this forecast actually dabbles into discussion about that. But before we actually see the numbers, just go ahead and see you know, why they're using the generic ballot. They see that, generally speaking, it provides an accurate indication of how voters are going to vote on the national level when it comes down to averaging out Republican votes and Democratic votes, which party wins. Typically speaking, it's the party that's leading in the generic ballot. And also, you know, it's allowing the model to input data that has been accurate in previous elections. When Democrats won the popular vote in 2020 in the House elections by a narrower result than the presidential vote, you weren't expecting too much good news for the Democratic Party. When Democrats did well in 2018 by winning by eight points nationwide, you probably would have expected the Democratic Party to regain control of the House of Representatives. So in 2020, in 2018, and even 2016, they provided moderately accurate indicators of how the states would vote, how the districts would vote, how the overall results would be. Um, and it does provide more context about the election, which is why they are using it in this model. And something that also I think that you can see just illustrated from 1946 to 2018 is just the sheer amount of changes in the House and Senate during a presidential party uh, midterm election. The average is a net loss of 27 seats in the House of Representatives. If Democrats can counteract that and make it less than 27, that's a good sign. In addition, the net loss in the Senate is a negative four, which means that you will be seeing potentially four seats that held by Democrats currently might go to the GOP if it follows the average. But we know after looking at the 2022 U.S. Senate map that simply won't be the case, but it's something just to think about. It's food for thought in relation towards this uh, analysis of the midterm elections. And they also go through and take a look at a number of values here, where it pretty much just says that a one point increase or decrease in the generic ballot in the House would allow the states or districts to swing by 1.7 seats. And each additional seat, every additional seat defended by the president's party would expect it to produce a net loss of more than 0.6 seats. In the Senate, you're seeing a one point increase or decrease, change it by just 0.2. And every additional seat defended by the president's party would be expected to produce a net loss of more than 0.8 seats. So not much of an implication in the United States Senate, a more significant one in the House of Representatives, but both are close. I mean, the Democratic Party, as this article also points out, cannot afford to lose House seats or a Senate seat. Because it's a 50-50 tie in the Senate, Democrats need every single vote. They need every single one of these incumbents to win re-election. Otherwise, it goes back to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So looking at this forecast here, it shows that a net loss of only a handful of House seats and a single Senate seat puts Republicans in control of both chambers of Congress. Our House majorities have reduced down to 220 to 211 because of vacancies. The Republican Party, I'm sure, is happy that the numbers are reducing, but it's reducing on both sides. But leading into 2022, you might actually see the election end up being pretty strong for the GOP. Looking at 2022, honestly speaking, the GOP is on track to regain control of the House of Representatives. So this article talks about what the Democratic Party would have to do and shows you the exact number. But it seems very unfair and unrealistic for the Democrats to be expected of this every single time. Based off this table, even if the Democratic Party wins the generic ballot by five percentage points, more than Biden won in the popular vote in 2020, Democrats lose seven seats. If they lose seven seats, that puts the GOP in the majority. Let's say the generic ballot is zero. Democrats lose 15 seats. Negative 5, 24, and negative 10, 32. 
The Democrats gain seats in the United States Senate as long as the House, uh, sorry, the generic ballot is tied or plus five or plus 10. So losses made in the House will be counteracted by gains made in the Senate. But I wouldn't exactly say this is a trade off the Democratic Party should be looking forward to. They need control of everything to maintain that trifecta. But you do have to understand how unrealistic that is. Because if Democrats, let's say, for instance, worst case, we're down 10 points in the generic ballot, uh, maybe in a very similar fashion to 2014, where Democrats lost the generic ballot by 5.7%. Or in 2010, when they lost by seven points nationwide. Not quite 10, but nearing there. Something just to provide a little bit more context to the situation. Well, if you apply that to our 2020 House results, what you'll notice is that the Democratic Party uh, goes down from 222 and the Republicans prop up to 245. Negative 10 brings the GOP from in the minority all the way up to 245 seats. Very reminiscent of 2014 when Republicans were at 247 seats to the Democratic Party's 188. So it seems here that the only viable pathway for Democrats to maintain control of the House and expand in both, really just maintain for the sake of the House, a net gain of two isn't doing much for Democrats. I'll show you 2018 for reference. In 2018, the Democratic Party won the generic congressional vote. Uh, Let's see if we can pull it up here won the generic congressional vote by 8.4% and gained 40 seats in 2018. Four, zero. If Democrats were to win by the same amount, even with just 222 seats, that would only put them ahead by two House seats. So they would go from 222 up to 224, not nearly as much as they had in 2018 or even in 2008 when Obama and the Democratic Party won in a very strong election. They wouldn't even reach 2006 numbers. So this is already putting the Democrats at a significant disadvantage to a point where they still you know, can't win no matter what happens. It raises questions of the legitimacy of not only the United States Senate, but also the House of Representatives. The House was built to represent American ideology, to represent big populations, to represent people fairly in Congress based off of that allocation. Well, if the Democratic Party has to win by 10 points in order to just retain control of the House, that begs the question, how fair is this congressional system? While much of it is rooted in gerrymandering and voter suppression and a number of other things, Democrats can't seem to be in a position where they can't say anything because they are losing. Democrats can't be idly by if they win by 10 points in the generic ballot, yet only gain two House seats as this forecast suggests. And honestly speaking, it just might be true. Democrats won the majority in 2020, but not by a lot. It was a hard fought congressional race across the United States, and Democrats actually won here by 3.1%. So while Democrats won by three points nationally speaking, the Democrats only gained three seats. And it was counteracted by the gaining of 15 by the GOP, meaning a net gain of 12 for the GOP over the Democratic Party. The gains made by the GOP counteracted the three gains by the Democratic Party. It was abysmal for Democrats. It was supposed to be a better election for them, a much better election where they were expanding their House majority. Typically speaking, the last time that the House expanded for the incumbent party in a re-election bid was in 2004. And that was the last time, didn't happen, uh, or sorry, not the incumbent party, for the Republican Party in a presidential election. Because when turnout is all the way high, typically speaking, the Democrats do better. That wasn't the case in 2020. It might have been on the presidential level and the Senate level, but that was not the case in the United States House of Representatives. So with this in mind, keep looking at those generic ballot polls, understand what that means. Because Democrats start out with this systemic disadvantage because they have larger portions of people in inner cities. Because major states, large states, are underrepresented in the Electoral College, underrepresented in the United States Congress. Certain districts might have double the amount of people of the entire state of Wyoming, or 500,000 more people. Looking at some of these districts, they seem unfairly drawn largely because They have so many people, yet the representation is similar to that of a state or that of a major metropolitan area. And that disenfranchises many of these voters because their votes aren't heard as often in Congress. 
So Democrats might be able to win this generic ballot, win the national popular vote by significant amounts time and time again. But it's very clear here in this explanation, in this model, that even if Democrats win the popular vote by 10 percentage points, they only gain two House seats. Gone are the days of the 2018 midterm elections, an election that was very strong for the Democratic Party that they should be very proud about. But if they're winning by 10 and they only gain two seats, if they won by eight and gained 40 seats in 2018, it tells you a lot about this system in place. It makes you question, is this fair? Is this truly a representation of our democracy? This model exposes what we've known for a long time. The popular vote system disadvantages the Democratic Party. It does allow them to win, but the system itself, where it's supposed to be predicting the winner, sometimes won't hold true. It wasn't true in 2020 in terms of the overall net gain. It was true in 2018. It wasn't true in 2016. Republicans won that, but Democrats gained. But then it was true in 2014. We're waiting to see what happens in 2024 and 2022. Which party is able to make significant gains in the House of Representatives? Will Republicans win back control? Will Democrats retain control? But this model, I think, really showcases just how hard it is for Democrats to maintain that House election with everything stacked up against them. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 midterm election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.